Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Peter, and I help direct the events here. Uh, for a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor and still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. Tonight, we are very excited to welcome back Strand alum Cory Doctorow to celebrate the release of his latest book, Radicalized, following on a long career which has seen him at the top of the New York Times bestseller list in policy positions at Creative Commons and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a Fulbright Fellow at USC, and co-editor of Boing Boing, Cory has collected here four urgent and far-seeing novellas that examine the way we live and the way we might yet live in the near, near future. And I say here because I was supposed to be holding a book, but I left it back there. Joining him to discuss these stories is Julia Angwin, uh, award-winning investigative journalist, formerly of the independent news organization ProPublica and the Wall Street Journal, and now the editor-in-chief of The Markup, a new nonprofit newsroom that will investigate the impact of technology on society. Julia has twice led investigative teams to the finalist circle of the Pulitzer Prizes in explanatory reporting and was awarded the prize in 2003 for her coverage of corporate corruption. I could not be more excited to have these two brilliant writers with us here tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Julie, Julia, Corey, and Radi Radicalized to the Strand. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. And thanks again to the Strand. Uh, uh, second or third time I've been in this room, and it's superb. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I come into this room, I, I feel my bank balance ticking down as I look at all the beautiful rare books. And I want to mention that on the way in, I noticed that um, Adam Rutherford is speaking one floor down. He's an old friend of mine who I had no idea was in town. He's, he's a Londoner. Uh, he's a brilliant uh, evolutionary biologist uh, and genomist who's, um, I, I don't know about his new book. I didn't even know he had a new book out because when you're concentrating on new books, you tend to not notice what your friends are doing. But you should go and see him when I'm done because he's amazing. Um, uh, so I, I was going to, the order of service tonight is I'm going to read briefly from uh, the new book from Radicalized uh, and then uh, we're gonna, Julia's going to come up and, and we're going to chat and, and thank you Julia for coming. Anand uh, sends his regrets. He was to come tonight and he's had a very dire uh, family emergency and, and sends his sincere regrets that he can't make it and Julia was very kind to step up. Oh hi Patrick, what are you doing in town? Uh, and uh, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a brief reading and then I'm going, we're going to have some questions together and then we're going to entertain your questions. Um, so the reading tonight, I should mention, uh, this is the third night of the tour. Uh, the previous two nights, I decided I would read this like really intense dramatic scene that has like suicide and dying children in it. And uh, after two nights, I decided that that was like just kind of a buzzkill. So um, <laughs> Tonight I'm going to read a scene I've never read before. It's a scene from the first of the four novellas, Unauthorized Bread, which is being adapted for TV by Topic, the, the TV arm of, of The Intercept. Um, and uh, I've never read it before, so if I'm a little rough, I, I offer my apologies in advance. Um, the Unauthorized Bread is about refugees who uh, win the lottery. They find themselves in, in subsidized refugee housing, having, having been on a waiting list for a long time. Uh, but that subsidized refugee housing comes at a price. Everything is uh, locked down. So their toaster only toasts authorized bread, and their fridge only will refrigerate authorized groceries, and, and, and their um, elevator only stops for them if there's no one who's from the uh, non-subsidized floors who wants to get in it. Uh, and this is about... Um, the, the day that the protagonist, Salima, uh, decides to jailbreak her toaster because the giant he faceless hedge fund that owns it has financially engineered itself into bankruptcy and it stopped working altogether. <laughs> After downloading the new firmware from the darknet, she had to remove the case, slicing through three uh, separate tamper evidence seals and a large warning sticker that threatened electrocution and prosecution, perhaps simultaneously for anyone foolish enough to ignore it, and locate a specific component and then short out two of its pins with a pair of tweezers while booting it. This dropped the toaster into test mode that the developers had deactivated but not removed. The instant the test screen came up, she had to jam in her USB stick, Removing the toaster's hood had revealed a set of USB ports, a monitor port, and even a little ethernet jack, all stock on the commodity single board PC that controlled it, at exactly the right instant, and then used the on-screen keyboard to tap in the login and password, which were admin and admin, of course. 
It took her three tries to get the timing right, but on the third try, the spare login screen, uh, the spare login screen was replaced with the pirate firmware's cheesy text art animation of a 3D skull, which she smiled at, and then she burst into laughter as a piece of text art toast floated into the frame and mer was merrily chomped to crumbs by the text art skull, the crumbs cascading to the bottom of the screen and forming shifting little piles. Someone had put a lot of effort into the physics simulation for that ridiculous animation. It made Salima feel good, like she was entrusting her toaster to deep, serious craftspeople, and not just randos who like to pit their wits against face faceless programmers from big, stupid companies. The crumbs piled up as the skull chomped and the progress bar indicator counted from 12% to 26% and then to 34%, where it stuck for a full 10 minutes until she was ready to risk really bricking the damn thing by unplugging it, but then 58% and so on, uh, onto an agonizing weight at 99%, and then all the crumbs rushed up from the bottom of the screen, went back through the skull's mouth, turning back into toast, each reassembled piece forming up in ranks that quickly blotted out the skull, and the words all done burned themselves into the toast surface, glistening with butter that ran down in rivulets. <laughs> she was just grabbing for her phone to get a picture of this awesome pirate load screen when the toaster blinked and rebooted itself. A few seconds later, she held a tight slice of bread to the toaster's sensor and watched as its light turned green and its door yawned open. Halfway through munching the toast, she was struck by an odd curiosity. She held her hand up to the toaster, palm out, as though it too were a slice of bread. The toaster's light turned green, and the door opened. She was momentarily t tempted to try and toast a fork, or a paper towel, or a slice of apple, just to see if the toaster would do it, but of course it would. This was a new kind of toaster, a toaster that took orders rather than giving orders, a toaster that would give her enough rope to hang herself, let her toast a lithium battery, or a can of hairspray, or anything else she wanted to toast. Unauthorized bread, even homemade bread, the idea made her feel a little queasy and a little tremorous. Homemade bread was something she'd read about in books, seen in old dramas, but she didn't know anyone who actually baked bread. That was like gnawing your own furniture out of whole logs or something. <laughs> the ingredients turned out to be incredibly simple, and while her first loaf came out looking like a poop emoji, it tasted amazing. Still warm from the little toaster, and if anything, the slice, or rather the lump, she, sa uh, she saved and toasted the next morning was even better, especially with butter on it. She left for work that day with a magical, warm, toasty feeling in her stomach. Thank you. So Julie, you want to come up? Hi, Julia. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me to. Oh, I'm so glad you could fill in. It was really kind of you. I, I'm really excited to be doing this. I'm such an admirer of your work. And, and I, I wanted to ask you, I know you've left ProPublica and you have a new thing you're doing. Could, could you tell us about it? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I know you're all here to, to hear about Corey. So just excuse this brief, brief intermission where I talk about this. But basically, my job is to write the nonfiction version of everything that Corey writes. And it's. Um, you know, I would say we should have a debate about which is harder. <laughs> right, sure, sure. But um, I'm starting a new nonprofit newsroom called The Markup. It'll launch, hopefully start publishing this summer. And what we're doing is investigating the impact of technology on society. Um, our, our thesis is that there's not enough sort of accountability journalism about the technology industry and its impact on humans. There is a lot of accountability about um, for shareholders, right, investors. Um, we have business journalism about it and that is all good and vibrant, but we haven't built enough of a field um, about what is happening to our world. And so that's what hmm. I'm uh, building a newsroom, which is probably half programmers and half journalists. We're going to use a lot of technology in our investigations of technology. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Julie's done some pretty amazing things, but one of them was um, fielding a tool to her readers that uh, scraped Facebook ads from their personal Facebook feeds, right? And then, and then you use that to analyze what kind of Facebook ads were being injected into people's feeds, right? Yeah, I mean, after the Trump election, um, we had the same queasy feeling that everyone else did, which was like, what happened on Facebook? Like, nobody knows. To this day, we haven't seen the corpus of those ads, right? We've heard about how they were really manipulative so we built a tool that would collect political ads from people's feeds. And so um, we built um, actually a machine learning classifier to identify what ads were political and contribute them to a public corpus. Yeah, yeah, it's superb. A, a really nice piece of, uh, of judo 
where you know well, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act would, might make it a crime for you to go and scrape all of the Facebook ads. You can have your readers deploy it as part of their own personal logins and kind of dare Facebook to sue them. Well, I would point out that uh, Facebook alleged that the individual users collecting their own ad data and sending it to ProPublica was a, a violation of the Computer oh, oh. Fraud and Abuse Act, <laughs> and uh, they actually shut down the tool. Um, uh, they blocked it from oh, working yeah. about a month ago. Yeah. Oh, right. So, Good. so it didn't end that yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's now you know like, why I don't have a Facebook account. <laughs> it's like the toaster that doesn't work, right? Yeah. It's like you can't, you know, how do you outsmart the machine? <laughs> yeah. By, by running away and shouting no, no, no as loud as you can, you consent to the following terms and conditions. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so should we talk about your Yeah, book? let's talk um, about the book. So... Um, I um, I just have to admit that I'm super jealous that you get to explore these topics um, in, in with your imagination because I am limited to the facts on the ground. Mm. And although those facts are often dystopian, um, uh, they're not, as far as I know, quite as far as you, where sure. you've painted them. Although I feel, and I feel like though the question I have for you is like you've painted them pretty much in today's world. Like it's not tomorrow right <laughs> yeah so i think that you know there there's a kind of category error that we make about science fiction that sometimes science fiction writers make which is to assume that science fiction writers are fortune tellers and that we can we can predict the future uh, i don't think the future is predictable i think that's probably the most hopeful thing you can say is that the future is not predictable and the reason the future is not predictable is because it changes based on what we do um, and so I'm much more interested in these kind of normative interventions, like here's what we should do, or here's what the future might be like, rather than this idea that, you know, Nostradamus is alive and well at the end of my pen. Uh, and, you know, despite, despite Robert Heinlein's protestations or whatever. And, and so one of the things that a science fiction writer can do is this kind of diagnostic trick. You know, when you go to see the doctor, with a sore throat and she swabs your throat and then scrapes it in a dish and then gives it a weekend and then looks at the dish under a microscope, she's not making an accurate model of your of your throat she, or your body, she's making a usefully inaccurate model of your body in which only one fact about your body, whatever that gunk is at the back of your throat, is present. And a science fiction writer can reach into the world and grab out a single technology or technological fact and build a, a, a thought experiment world around it, not one that's meant to be accurate, but, but that again is usefully inaccurate, that gives us uh, a, a kind of visceral, atavistic, kind of architectural fly-through of what it's like to live in a world in which this one technological fact becomes all-pervasive. Not because that will ever happen, but because that lets us think more clearly about what's going on right now, right at this moment. And, you know, in terms of the future, like the present is the, the, you know, the moving wave front in which the past is becoming the future. So if you can make people think about the present, you can change the future, which is much more interesting than predicting it. I love that. Um, Cause that is something that I feel like is a problem nowadays with science fiction is that if you expect it to be a prediction, it, um, so many things are already happening. So it's like disappointing. <laughs> <You're> like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that there's also a recipe for writing relatively future-proof science fiction, at least in, in the context of, of um, computers and, and to uh, a lesser extent maybe machine learning, which is to assume that the underlying theory is relatively stable, right? Like computer science is, uh, it changes from time to time, but it, it doesn't change like computer engineering does, right? Like we come up with all kinds of really cool ways to put more traces on a die, right? Or to, you know, parallelize computation across different different cores on a single board or whatever. But like the underlying theory, like can you make a computer that can run all the programs except for one that really angers authorities? That has been a relatively stable proposition since the days of Alan Turing. And if you want to write science fiction that in 10 years will remain salient, all you have to do is assume that computers will continue to be more and more important and more interwoven in all of our lives, that we will continue to fail to grapple with their underlying theoretical reality, and that as a consequence, there will be continuingly terrible consequences uh, from the mismatch between our policy and the theory of how computers work, and as a result, we'll just have more and more awful consequences, and that, you know, that, that's evergreen, right? Little brother is 13 years old. And although, you know, it predates Twitter and social media to a large extent, and it's not really present in the story, and if I were gonna rewrite it today, I, I would put those in, 
the actual story continues to be very much alive in people's imaginations and people read it and they go, oh yeah, this really chimed with my lived experience of being in a world of computers and knowing about computers and worrying about computers and so on, not because of, of the specifics, but because of the generalities. The generalities of computers are important, lawmakers don't understand that, they regulate computers like their jihadi recruiting systems or pornography distribution systems or video on demand services. And then that redounds through all the other things we use computers for and it's terrible. And that, you know, you can write future proof science fiction all day long just by assuming those things will remain stable over the long term. <laughs> I had no idea that you had inoculated your <laughs> fiction against mm. the future, very smart. Future proofing, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so should we talk about some of the stories in yeah, here? Yeah, sure, um, let's do. So I, um, I really, I was surprised at how much I love this one, Model Minority, um, because it's a, a superhero story, and um, essentially it's a superhero who's trying to take on racism, police brutality, racism. Yeah, punch racism. Punch racism, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I just thought it was really interesting because it was so, it was actually kind of optimistic. Like I thought, oh wow, what a nice story. <laughs> well, it's a story about the limits of punching racism in some ways. <laughs> yeah. So it's a Superman story and it's, uh, although I, he's called American Eagle for obvious reasons in this and not <laughs> Superman. But it's, it's uh, a, I wrote it after reading Matt Taibbi's amazing book about the NYPD uh, squad who murdered Eric Garner. Uh, who had operated with impunity for years and never faced any consequences for their murder. These are guys who used to run around with t-shirts with quotes from Hemingway about how uh, exhilarating it was to hunt humans and who racked up uh, millions of dollars in, in damages for the city from their unprovoked, vicious, violent attacks on, on racialized people, primarily African Americans, s at, largely at, uh, as the result of um, uh, algorithmic systems that require them to meet quotas and to also police in certain areas and so on. So, uh, what, as I was reading this story, I had, I think, a, a, a natural and also very childish reaction, which, which was to think, oh God, if only I could have gotten in between them and Eric Garner, if only someone was strong enough to do this. And that got me thinking about Superman. Wow, someone's really having a problem out there. Uh, that got me thinking about Superman, who, as you probably know, Superman was written by two Jewish kids, one from New York and one from Toronto, who were on this side of the Atlantic Ocean during uh, the Second World War, and who wrote this violent revenge fantasy about punching Nazism out of existence. And, um, you know, as someone who grew up in, in that city and in that milieu, my dad was a displaced person, his, his parents were in the Red Army, uh, and and uh, and as someone who struggles every day with being called a self-hating Jew for coming out against the system of apartheid in Israel, it was a thing that I was really alive to. And and the Superman figure in this story, as soon as he uh, decides that he's no longer going to be on the side of the establishment and throws his lot in with with people who are oppressed by the establishment, discovers that what he thinks of as his unassailable whiteness and even his humanity can be jettisoned in an instant if he changes sides. And he's very quickly becomes an alien and you have you know, pundits on the radio saying, well, we call him the American Eagle, but what's to stop him from becoming the Iranian Eagle? You know, he's an all-powerful being from another planet. Why have we put so much of our trust in him? Do, can we really trust him? And it made me think about, about people who, a couple of years ago, woke up one day uh, feeling like they were white and watched a bunch of um, people in Confederate uniforms in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us, and realized that maybe their whiteness was a lot more contingent than they thought it was, and maybe throwing their lots in with white supremacy was not a good bargain, because you, the last one's in and the first one's out. Uh, and that really maybe their side was always on the side of racialized people and, and not on the side of white supremacy. And so I tried to kind of surface that in this superhero story that dug into the like foundational id of Superman and you know kind of got into the territory that Siobhan explored a little with Cavalier and Clay and this idea of 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 superheroes and you know there's a great exhibit up on the Upper West Side a couple of years ago about about um, Jews and comics and and Jews and superheroes and and trying to channel some of that. Well, in the sort of typically Jewish fashion, it does have a slightly sad ending. Yeah, it does. It's a very melancholic, yeah, Old Testament kind of ending, for sure. Um, um, but not as sad as the um, uh, Mask of Red Death. Yeah, Mask of the Red Death. 
<laughs> Holy moly. I'm not yeah. even sure what to say about that one. It was, um, I, you should all read it, but it's terrifying. Well, it's about preppers, <laughs> right? It's about rich preppers who um, have this, the, the foundational belief that defines the uh, political right. There's a great book by Corey Robin called The Reactionary Mind that's a history of right-wing thinking since um, the, the French Revolution. And he, the question he's trying to answer is, what is it that makes someone on the right? Because you have, on the one hand, you have people who identify as like finance people and who think that America shouldn't engage in imperialist wars because they're needless destruction of capital. Then you have people who are white supremacists who think that America has a duty to, to tame the lesser people of the world. And you have dominionists and you have uh, you know, all kinds of people who, who kind of fit under the banner of, of, of the right, but who don't have a lot in common or have a lot in difference. But um, what Robin defines as their, their commonality is the belief that the world has a hierarchy, a naturally occurring hierarchy of birth, that some people are job creators or kind of masters or ubermenschen or whatever it is, and that the, the world is at its best when the best people are on top, kind of a Plato's Republic version of politics, um, and that uh, the world is in, in disarray when other people are, are not subservient to the best people. And um, the Mask of the Red Death is about a captain of industry who fancies himself one of the best people, but who has enough game theory and empathy to say, well, if I were one of those people who was one of the lesser people, who was being automated out of the necessity, out of necessity for existence. There's no reason for me to be here anymore. I don't need, now that we have robots, we don't even need poor people to suppress other poor people's wages by hanging around being unemployed as an example of what would happen if you didn't uh, accept the conditions given to you by your boss. Well, if I was one of those people, I might erect a guillotine on my lawn. Uh, and, and so, He's ready that when the lights go out, when things go bad, he's ready for, for the poors to come and eat him. And so he's built a bunker to go and hide in. And he fancies that when the, when the lights come back on, when, when someone else reboots civilization, that he and his heavily armed posse of Ubermenschen will ride out with their thumb drives full of Bitcoin and their, their uh, gemstone quality uh, precious stones uh, and, their, and their great an enormous cache of ammunition, and that they'll live out this kind of Mad Max beyond Thunderdome warlord fantasy of, uh, you know, Frazetta painting forever, right? <laughs> and, and what he's kind of missed is that um, uh, we have a kind of shared microbial destiny, and that the, the, you know, any kind of catastrophe that doesn't involve rebooting the, the sanitation system ends in cholera. And so this goes very badly for him in his bunker, and, and, you know, kind of his, he never achieves the moment of Satori in which he realizes that the true heroes of the apocalypse are the people who stay in town and get the, get the sewers running again and not the people who hide in bunkers ready to come out and take the, the city from them once, once things have been stabilized. <laughs> I read this. I tried to read it while I was eating lunch. Mm. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. Yeah. It should have a little warning label or something. Color is, color is pretty visceral, for sure, <laughs> so to speak. I was, cr ah! yeah, I yeah. was cramming a little bit because. Uh, you had short notice. <laughs> short notice. Yeah. So, um, so um, the, the next one, though, that I thought um, is also a little bit optimistic is um, radicalized. Yeah, yeah, radicalized. It's uh, another thought experiment. I, I was um, listening to a documentary about um, African American parents uh, and uh, sickle cell anemia and watching their children go through this undertreated and incredibly painful disease. As my own uh, daughter was coping with much less painful but still quite distressing normal childhood illnesses, and thinking, God, if, if this were me, I would be inconsolable and beside myself. And then I happened on all these accounts of, of um, uh, people who are medically insured but who watch their loved ones die of preventable illnesses and, uh, and, and because their insurers won't cover the treatments, they, they unilaterally declare the treatments to be, uh, to be uh, experimental. Um, and, and I thought, you know, like, God, the forbearance of people is amazing. And what if someday angry white men stopped shooting their ex-wives and brown people and started killing healthcare executives instead. <laughs> and... That was the optimistic part I was referring that to. That was the optimistic <laughs> part. Not that they should. 
<laughs> but it's but it is kind of a mystery, right? It is kind of a mystery that it doesn't happen. And then you know this raises all kinds of chewy questions, like how long would it take us to call affluent white men terrorists if they were killing much more affluent white men? <laughs> uh, when did the, when would they stop being lone wolves? Um, and, and that was the thing I really wanted to dig in. I think the answer I came up with was six, six, six <laughs> bombings. Um, but uh, also, I was I, it, it brought to mind this old study I read from Boston, some Boston University psych professors who researched uh, suicide bombers in the occupied territories, and the, they were trying to figure out what came first, the suicidal impulse or the ideology. And their conclusion was that the typical suicide bomber was someone who'd been horribly traumatized and then weaponized by an ideologue who said, you know, if you're going to do something drastic, don't let it go to waste. Uh, and um, that our normal narrative of, of, of um, radicalization is that, radi is that uh, you know, people who are radicalizers have a kind of mind control ray and they take people who are otherwise okay and then they beam the mind control ray into them and they become incels or suicide bombers or whatever. And uh, the, a much more plausible narrative is that it's the other way around, that, that trauma precedes, precedes radicalization, precedes weaponization. And you know, our, our, our policy consensus is that the right answer to, radical, to radicalization is like the world's shittiest apology. You know, the world's shittiest apology goes, I'm really sorry you're angry at me and I wish you weren't. Right? And the, the answer to radicalization is, I'm really sorry that our world has made you so upset. Let's see if we can make you less upset without changing any of the material facts of the world. And so I, want, I wanted to write a story that kind of dug into that and, and dug into a kind of analogy for the incel phenomenon. I, um, it's not widely known, but the person who coined the term incel was a queer Canadian women, woman who started a message board for people like her who were struggling to find uh, physical uh, uh, intimacy. And she realized after a point that while other kinds of support systems would have these elder states people would hang around, you know, if you're on a message board for people who are trying to kick alcohol addiction, the kind of elder states people of that are people who've been dry for years. And when you go off the wagon and do something terrible and, and are recriminating with yourself, they can give you stories about how the same thing happened to them and they overcame it. But that in the incel world, everyone who figured it out left. And that the only people who were there to be elder states people were the people who are the most toxic and least redeemable. And they were the ones who were setting the tone. And that she was the last one standing who, who wasn't in that category and that it was too much for her. And so she left too. And after the, the incel murders, and there have been a lot of them, including in Toronto, uh, she started to speak about this. And that also really kind of chimed with me. And, and so I wanted to write a story that dug into those themes. Yeah, it was very, com I mean, compelling treatment because I felt for the, it was rare to see the story of radicalization from the protagonist being radicalized and you were with him. You were like, no, that's right. That's sure. a perfectly reasonable <laughs> response. Well, you know, rights are never given. They're always taken. And the line between, um, you know, uh, uh, too much and just enough, it's a hard call to make in the moment. And, you know, on the left, for example, there have been lots of people, well, on both sides, on the left and the right, there have been lots of people who in the moment have cheered on people who later on they regretted um, because it seemed like their cause was just and that, you know, uh, an excess of zeal in the pursuit of a just cause is no vice, you know? And then subsequently, with the judgment of history, came to decide, well, you know, maybe, maybe that wasn't the right thing after all. Uh, I'm, I'm really struck by the story of George Orwell, who was shot through the stro throat by a Stalinist while fighting in the Spanish Revolution, and who at the end of his life fell in love with a secret policewoman from the British Intelligence Service and gave her a list of his comrades who he suspected were secret Stalinists to, to round up. And you know, kind of what it's like to, to live through both sides of that, the idea that maybe you know, the, the right thing to do is to, is to uh, cheer on the people regardless of their, their, their warts and their flaws and then to later on regret it and how neither of those are a particularly comfortable place to be. Well, I didn't know that about Orwell. It's not <laughs> a well-known fact about Orwell. He was a complicated and not great guy in a lot of ways. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to have to adjust my thinking. <laughs> Me too. But if you read Homage to Catalonia, where he describes being in this anarchist camp who are being shot at by the Stalinists, yep. not by the Francoites, right? Not by the fascists, but by people who are theoretically on the same side as them. Uh, and what that was, that kind of atavistic, never ending, you know, animus that he conceived of that just lurked with him forever and that scarred him. He was never able to really truly trust people on the left after that, you know? Wow. Was Big Brother then a leftist? <laughs> like, so Little Brother, a Big Brother is a, you know, 1984 is a story about, about Stalinism. You know, it's a story about the, the betrayal of the revolution mm. by the Stalinists as much as anything else. And it's a story about British Stalinists. It's not a story about the Russian Revolution, you know? Well, I'm betraying my ignorance here. I will um, you have to be, beat up. So, you know, this is like the thing is that if you're raised by communists, you understand all of these, like, narrow distinctions that you have to read a hundred boring books to understand uh, that make two people who seem to have nearly identical points of view like, dire enemies, right. you know? <laughs> Um, but at the same time, you know, that's where all the, that, it, getting into arguments with people you like is so much worse than getting into arguments with people you hate. Because you can't win an argument with someone you love. If you win, you, you're miserable. And if you yeah. lose, you're angry. Uh, you know, this was kind of the underlying premise of walk away is what if the, what if the, um, real, the fights that mattered were between people who were mostly on the same side, but couldn't reconcile. I mean, that does seem like a saying for our time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyone who's ever won an argument at Christmas dinner knows that you don't win <laughs> arguments at Christmas dinner. Yes. Um, maybe we should go to Unauthorized Bread, which was, uh, yeah. that was a hilarious reading. Um, it's funny because, you know, when I started reading that, I thought it would go a slightly different way because... When I think of the Internet of Things, which is essentially what you're talking yeah, sure. about, I always think about how it's going to be used as a debt collection device mm -hmm. um, and that that will be the sort of harm, you know, that she didn't pay her bills. Right. But, of course, it was actually worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that you can understand the Internet of Things as um, a system for delivering four things. So the first is it's the, it's the um, ending of, of property as we understand it. Uh, you know, if you've ever, if you go to law school and you do like a property law course, like the first thing they'll give you is this quote from Blackstone uh, that defines property. Property is that which uh, man ex enjoys sole and despotic dominion over to the exclusion of every other man in the universe, right? That's, that's, that's his definition. And yet, you know, if you have an iPhone, you don't get to choose whose software you install on it. Right? Or if you have an HP printer, they're pushing software up to updates to it that stop you from installing third-party ink. Right? This is like this is the opposite of sole and despotic dominion, right? Like you own this, but you are bound by these license agreements and you're tethered to a server, and periodically they're just pushing these updates that force you to arrange your affairs to benefit the shareholders at the expense of your own interests. Right, that's like, that, that is like the opposite of property. So it's a kind of return to feudalism in which property is the exclusive purview of like these transhuman artificial colony life forms called limited liability companies. And, and human beings are like the inconvenient gut flora. And you know, if we, don't, if we don't arrange ourselves to the benefit of the host organism, then we're flushed, right? But the, the other thing that it does is it allows firms to use a combination of laws to control their, comp their competitors, right? So, you know, HP can field a printer and then decide who gets to make compatible inks, and Apple can field a phone and decide who gets to make compatible software, and it lets them control their customers. So if you wanna, if you wanna use your device in a way that benefits you at the expense of the manufacturer, you can't. So, you know, Tesla can sell you a, a, a car with a battery that's rated for X kilometers, but they can sell it to you at a, at a discount and dial the battery's capacity down to half of X and then force you to buy an upgrade in order to get the full use of a thing that you, that you own, right? They've, they've put a little kind of governor in it so the battery just won't run even when it has charge because you haven't paid the full ride for it. And it also lets them control their critics. So under laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and under trade secret law, uh, firms can decide who can report defects in their products, who can disclose security vulnerabilities. And, you know, this is the, normally an, in a First Amendment regime, you assume that like disclosing true facts about defects in products that lots of people use and rely on would be protected speech. But we have this weird carve out 
this exception to the First Amendment in the form of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and the exception has swallowed the rule. Because all you need to do is design your device so that you have to bypass a copyright protection system in order to investigate it, and then all investigations are illegal unless they're conducted with the permission of the manufacturer. And so, you know, in a world where you can't own anything and where critics uh, and competitors and customers are all uh, subject to the whim of the manufacturer, you have this kind of supercharged inequality that makes firms bigger, gives them more influence over policy outcomes. And that's the kind of thing I wanted to illustrate with the story. And I also wanted to dig into this thing I call the, the bad technology adoption curve, where we try our worst technologies on the people with the least ability to complain. So the first people to encounter them are refugees, and then you know traditional immigrants, and then prisoners, and then parolees, and then mental patients, and then students, and kids, and then uh, blue collar workers, gig economy workers, and white collar workers. And you know science fiction writers can't predict the future, but if you want to get a kind of general sense of what your technological future will be like if nothing changes, just look at the technology we expect kids or prisoners or refugees or immigrants to use, and you'll get at what your future will likely look like you know, if nothing else changes. That's dark. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, um, you recently rejoined EFF to fight on this exact issue, sure, right? Yeah. And I'm curious, how is that going? Well, it's with? a little stalled. So we, we brought a legal challenge to the DMCA, to Section 121 of the DMCA. We're representing Matthew Green from Johns Hopkins and Bunny Wang at MIT, the guy who broke the Xbox, both eminent uh, security researchers and, and technologists. Uh, and we have a suit pending. And we filed the suit, and the government filed a motion to dismiss, as you would expect they would. And then the judges sat on it for over two years now. Uh, and it turns out that you can't make a judge rule on a motion. And they can just take as long as it takes. So we are currently discussing with some other plaintiffs in a more uh, potentially more effective circuit, uh, <laughs> filing their own challenges to the DMCA. And you know that's a thing that I've been working on even on tour. Uh, we just tracked down some people the other day. We had someone who was really great, but who managed to resolve their problems. You need someone with a, with a, a controversy uh, you know, a case to get the court to, to, to hear it. And so we had someone who had a case because they had an intransigent vendor and they had a really good case. And, and fortunately for them and unfortunately for us, the vendor caved. Uh, and you know, EFF as a law firm, our first duty is to our clients, even though we try to change the law. And so we always advise our clients to do what's best for them. And it was clearly best for this client to take the settlement from the firm. Uh, they were involved in, in helping a relative who had profound disabilities gain access to assistive technology that had been locked up behind a, a copyright protection scheme. And you know, it would have been outrageous to say, well, can't you just hold off and live without the benefit of this technology so we can sue the government? So you know, we're, we're very, in fact, very glad for them that, that things have gone well for them. You know, it's, this is the right thing. This is the outcome you hope for. But uh, we now have some other uh, plaintiffs we're discussing this with, and we hope that we'll be able to file another challenge and get things moving. We'll, we'll run both cases in parallel. But this is really, I mean, if there's a through line to your life's work, it's copyright challenge, it, I think. It is and it is. So you're right. I came to it through copyright. Uh, and originally my interest in it was like expression. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. But an, an infinitesimal fraction of people work in the arts, right? Like. We in the arts like flatter ourselves that the most important thing about the world is is the arts, but it's a we're we're minuscule. We're, we 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 we're a rounding error, and the most salient thing about copyright is that it's expanded to regulate things like pacemakers, right? That that you know Johnson and Johnson got regulatory approval for an implanted uh, pancreas, an artificial pancreas. It's a glucose monitor and a um, a uh, um, uh, insulin uh, pump with some machine learning stuff that tries to control your dosage and keep your blood sugar even. And insulin is in the public domain. Banting and Best, Canadians, uh, when they discovered insulin, they said, this is too important to patent. We're going to release it to the public. So of course, Johnson & Johnson can't charge you over the odds for the insulin. But the cartridge it comes in is proprietary. And the cartridge, when it empties out, even if you refill it, continues to maintain that it's empty to the device. And resetting the cartridge involves bypassing a copyright protection system. And so they can force people to buy the consumables for their internal organs at an enormous markup for no good reason apart from the fact that it benefits their shareholders. Right? 
this is this is terrible. Um, and you know that is the more salient thing about copyright, right? It's it's you know we, there's this copyright directive fight pending in the European Union, which is really bad. They're, they want to man mandate copyright filters for all the big platforms and, and incidentally all the smaller platforms as well. So everything you upload is going to be checked to see whether it matches something in a, in a database that anyone can add anything to of things that no one's allowed to say or, or post or, or write or, or take photographs of or make videos of or make audio clips of. And there's no control stopping people from posting just anything, putting the works of William Shakespeare in and stopping you quoting Shakespeare on Twitter. And there's nothing stopping, you know, cops who get videoed uh, beating someone up from uploading that video and claiming copyright in it and stopping anyone from sharing it and so on. And it's true that like one of the impacts of that is going to be really bad for creators, that it's, you know, our stuff will get caught in these nets and we're going to have to ally ourselves with big corporate publishing institutions and we'll have a weaker bargaining position and we'll get less money as a result. But the real impact is on people whose lives online have so much more to do, m more going on than how they're entertained, right? The internet is like how we find romance and how we conduct our family lives. It's how we do our education and our employment and it's how we do our, our civic and our political engagement. And the idea that like the possibility that you might watch TV the wrong way should cut you off or compromise your ability to do all this other stuff is so foundationally unjust, right? And, and you know, it's only because copyright has become the means by which this injustice is carried on because it's been instrumentalized by people who aren't in the entertainment industry. You know, and I was at a Chatham House Rules Dinner uh, a few years ago, is where you're not allowed to name the parties, but you can describe what they said, um, uh, of uh, industry representatives talking about about DRM and copyright, digital rights management and copyright, and about the fact that you can't, increasingly you can't choose your own mechanic for your car or fix your own car. That the engine diagnostics and the spare parts require you to bypass a copyright protection system to access them, and only the authorized service depots can do it, and they charge over the odds you can't fix your own car. And increasingly through the night, it became obvious that the consensus among the people at the table was that this was not going to fly with the American public. That if this ever came up for a court challenge, that the courts would be really unsympathetic to the idea that, that only GM can tell you who can fix your car. And, and that maybe that, that this was a bad idea. And then a person representing the traditional entertainment side of the, of the, of the aisle said, um, maybe we should ask the D Department of, of Transport or the National Highway Traffic Safety Board to just make it illegal to put this copyright protection stuff in cars. And the people from the embedded system side of the house, you know, the people who were actually doing this, were aghast that they were being literally thrown under the bus, right? Because the entertainment industry wants to keep these laws intact, and these guys are kind of Johnny-come-latelys, right? They're not, they have nothing to do with copyright. Your car is not a copyrighted work, right? Your toaster is not a copyrighted work. Your phone is not a copyrighted work. It's a device. And the idea that a law that was crafted and contoured to protect literary creations and films is being distorted to make sure that you don't audit voting machines is so outrageous. And to me, that's what the copyright fight has become. Yes, let's make sure that artists get fair deals. Let's make sure that creativity is protected. But honestly, let's not lose sight of the real business here. That if, if copyright becomes the means by which we decide who's allowed to use the internet and what they're allowed to say, this redounds far beyond the mere concerns of people who help you pass the long hours between the cradle and the grave with meaningless <laughs> entertainments. Um. Oh, Peshaw. <laughs> I think it's time for audience yeah. questions. So I, I like to call alternately on people who identify as women and people who identify as men and non-binary people can step up any time. It, it's a, I know that it puts women on the spot, um, especially because historically dudes spend at least half the time during the presentation thinking of a cool question to ask, whereas women are actually paying attention. But. Um, <laughs> I do like to start that way, and I like to, to carry it on that way, and it does work. We do end up with, a, with I think, better questions, more interesting questions, and, a, and obviously we get a more equal mix. So if there's any people who identify as women or non-binary who'd like to start, we have a microphone there, uh, and, and we can start that off. And if you want to take a minute to, to think about it, I can vamp for a bit, too. <laughs> he told me behind, and right before we came out, that there's always a pause. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always a pause. It's OK. you know. Let me take a minute. Hi. 
How about that local sports team? <laughs> Those Blue Jays. I don't know how many baskets the Blue Jays scored in their last match. N, where N is a good number of baskets. All right, uh, well, well, oh, go ahead. Yes, please, there's a microphone right behind you there. Thanks. I think they're video recording it, hence the mics. Hi. Um, do you uh, see that there might be a sense of hope um, because of a, um, a new uh, crop of people coming into Congress where they have a little bit more education and knowledge about what the effects are. And, yeah. and so I'm just wondering. That's an excellent question. So I do have a lot of hope, and, and um, I'm glad you used the word hope as opposed to optimism. I think of optimism as a form of prediction, which as I've said, I'm not very fond of. But hope, you know, it's the idea that like if you, if you work, maybe you can materially improve your circumstances. And when you attain a new, a new spot, from that work, you may see another way that you can attain an even higher peak and so on. Um, and I do have hope, but it's not because of the expertise, although I think they do have some expertise. I think it's because of the sense that evidence-based policy emerges from a pluralistic and, and uh, secular process that's not driven by the parochial interests of industry. So we, we have this um, tendency to think that computers are so transcendentally complicated that dumb old lawmakers can't possibly hope to understand them. But our world is full of super complicated things that lawmakers don't understand, and yet they make good policy about. Nuclear weapons, uh, uh, vaccines, uh, public, other public health issues related to sanitation and so on. These are complicated, difficult issues, urban planning. And the way that um, those industries, or those, those uh, domains emerge with good policy is that lawmakers have an evidence-based fact-finding process where they listen to experts, they employ their own experts, they um, don't blindly follow the recommendations of industry. They, they have a fair process, and then they have um, a secondary process that evaluates the outcome of the decisions that they make. And the thing that I see from lawmakers like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and the other new crop of lawmakers that are coming in is not merely their technological savvy. I mean, it's nice to have people who, who think of this stuff as important. But it's, it's also their skepticism about blindly following industry recommendations. Because that doesn't get us very far. I mean, you can see it in, in things like, um, uh, in West Virginia, there was, there's a docket open on, on uh, water pollution levels. And uh, an, an industry body that is, its major member is Dow, but they front for the chemical industry in, in West Virginia, which is the largest industry in West Virginia, just filed comments saying, we need to up the safe levels of toxic materials in our water supply. And it will be fine because West Virginians on average are a lot fatter than other Americans. And so the toxins will be diluted in their bodies. And also they don't drink a lot of water. And so they won't be affected by this. You know, this is like the kind of really shitty policy that emerges from lobbyists, right? And it, it doesn't bear like any kind of scrutiny. And if it's subject to any kind of fair process, it falls away, right? But in the absence of a fair process, or where you have uh, regulators whose thumbs are on the scale for industry, you know, the net neutrality debate would be a good example, where you had millions of comments filed by obvious uh, identity thieves who had stolen the identities of dead people, of sitting senators. Um, they, they filed a million comments where the email address domain was pornhub.com. <laughs> and, and Ajit Pai, the, the former Verizon executive, who's our FCC chairman, said, who can say which comments are fake and which ones are real? We will default to a posture of openness and consider all comments equally. And because we have all these millions of duplicative comments from one IP address, that has, you know, with Pornhub addresses and slightly fewer millions from lots of IP addresses from all across America, well, it's a wash. I guess we're going to kill net neutrality, right? That's like, that is not a lack of understanding. It's a lack of willingness to engage in a fair evidence-based policy. 
So this anti-oligarchic moment gives me hope much more than the generational uh, characteristics of the lawmakers we've just put in Congress. So are there any people who identify as men or non-binary you'd like to ask the next question? Mike's just there. Yeah, come on up. Here you go. Yep, your turn. Hi. Hi. This has been really interesting. Um, Thank you. So there was like this research that people made a lot out of where like people don't change their mind when they're presented information uh -huh. against their like worldviews. But my mind has changed a lot in the last like two or three years because of the podcasts I listen to, the articles I read. What do you think the role of fiction and nonfiction is in getting people to actually change their position on things? Julia, I'd love your answer on nonfiction. Do you have a view on that? I do. Um, I believe, um, I actually believe that we are getting smarter about changing our minds and that we are convinced by the evidence. Like the data is what changes our policies. And so um, even though we, I've read the same things you have, like the, the facts on the ground are when somebody can present like the overwhelming evidence of climate change, there really isn't another side to that story, right? And similarly, there are many things, very complex things like nuclear weapons and vaccines where we have as a society amassed the evidence and looked at the data and made good decisions. And so as a journalist, I, I am a very committed to um, presenting data sets. So most of the work I do, we pub publish all our data, we collect the data at scale. I believe like one of the founding missions of the markup is gonna be that we're not gonna have those stories with like three anecdotes proves a trend, <laughs> right? Um, and so, um, so I think data does change people's minds. I don't think it changes them overnight. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. You know, I, I have this idea of like peak indifference, that where you have these, these um, problems whose perniciousness is related to the fact that cause and effect are separated by a lot of time and space. You know, climate is a, a really good example. That, you know, the, w one of the reasons that there's room for doubt about climate is that it's not immediate, right? Like, you don't, you don't do a thing and then watch it get warmer. It's that you have these long lags and the effects are felt halfway around the world sometimes. Uh, and it's hard to sort of pinpoint exactly what the causal relationship is. But, you know, I if, the, if the problem is real, and we don't do anything about it, then over time it gets worse. And so it solves, its, the, the, on its own, it solves the, the difficulty of getting people to admit that there is a problem. Right? Give it enough time, and you know, by the time we're all like digging through rubble for canned goods and drinking our own urine, climate change will be undeniable, right? <laughs> and there comes a moment long before then of peak indifference where the number of people who doubt that there's a problem only goes down because we've accumulated so much policy debt that the problem just keeps manifesting, keeps hurting people. Privacy is a good example of that right now, where you know it's just going to be more breaches. We've we've put so much privacy carbon into the internet atmosphere that you know these that we're just going to have like these horrible hard rains over and over and over again. Like we're just you know all those silos will breach. You know there's, there's just like the, the, almost all that stuff will never be deleted. It'll just be leaked. Bef before anyone can do anything about it. And so then the issue changes from the hard problem of convincing people that there's a problem to the hard problem of convincing people that it's not too late to do something about it. Uh, you know, so it's kind of point of no return versus the point of peak indifference or, or nihilism versus, versus denialism. And fiction can play a real role in that because fiction can describe a path where people can work together to solve wicked problems. Where, where we can find collective solutions to problems that are bigger than the individual. And you know, the problem of climate and, and, and other problems that we have, privacy and so on, they've been made much worse by 40 years of doctrinal individualism that says that all problems have individual solutions, right? The, the reason we have climate change is because of your recycling habits, you personally. You know, did you once put a pizza box in the cardboard thing even though it had grease on it that would stop it from being recycled? It's because of you, right? <laughs> Sorry. And if only you had been more diligent about separating your waste stream, right? And s clearly these are like social problems. They're collective problems. And, and fiction can give us a super detailed, high resolution, emotional fly through of what it feels like to be engaged in a collective solution. And it can, it can forestall the nihilism that, uh, you know, kind of gets you to the point where it's like, well, if there's only one rhino left, we might as well find out what it tastes like. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. Do we have any questions from people who identify as women? And then maybe we'll do one more from a man, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. And if there's anyone who's non-binary, feel free to come up anytime. Yeah. Do you want to just grab the mic there? So the question is, what do you think of the book Zuck? Just for the oh, video there. Um, I have not read Zucked yet, actually, but I um, I know the author and I've talked to him extensively and I know a lot of what he says about it. And um, I guess uh, sort of piggybacking off what you were saying um, a little bit, I don't actually believe that it matters that much whether Mark Zuckerberg is a good person or a bad person, right? Like I. Um, I think the problem we have is, is privacy is a pollution problem, and we are um, we think of it as something like that. We're always confused about privacy. We're like, why, um, why don't I feel the harm, even though I know it's creepy? And the reason is because it's a societal problem. It's not actually your problem. It will be what your problem one day, right? <laughs> but it you haven't been targeted yet for you know identity theft or whatever is going to happen, or you haven't been denied a job some, for some false data point. Um, but, uh, or maybe you have, but most people haven't. And so I feel like, I was thinking about while you were talking about um, uh, how fiction can help diagnose problems, I was thinking about Silent Spring uh -huh. and how... Um, yeah, I, she was wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, she was. Yeah. But it was, but she captured the imagination and her diagnosis spurred like, something that I would say is like m the most collective action that we've taken as a society, like cleaning up the environment was a massive undertaking, right? And we actually did a pretty good job. We screwed up on carbon, but like the, the rivers are not on fire anymore. Like coal is not raining down from the sky. Um, and I feel like that's where we are with privacy. Like we're at that point where you could write a silent spring. You are writing basically a series of silent springs <laughs> about what's gonna happen with all this data out there. Yeah, I I think that um, you know that one of the things that was was a turning point in the in the world of environmentalism was the coining of the term ecology, and this is the thing Jamie Boyle talks about a lot that before the term ecology you had people who cared about whales and people who cared about birds and people who cared about forests and people who cared about rivers, but they didn't have a word to describe what all those things had in common, right? There's there wasn't a sense that this was like one big issue. And I think that in privacy, we have yet to find the defining term that binds it all together. We keep grasping for it. Like a lot of people want to put property rights in as the thing, like you've stolen my data, right? You've heard that said a lot, I'm sure. Mark Zuckerberg stole all our data. Property is a really shitty metaphor for privacy, right? Like the fact that you and I have a conversation, whose property is that? Is it mine or is it yours? Or if it's both of ours, then when, uh, under what circumstances can one of us disclose it? Um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a like evidence of the weird pathology of 40 years of Reaganomics and the elevation of property is the only way we have to talk about things being valuable, that we can only think of privacy in, in property terms. But you know, we have like, we have sui generis legal regimes for very valuable things that have nothing to do with property, like humans, right? Calling people human, uh, calling humans property makes you a monster. Right? And yet humans are undeniably valuable. And if someone were to kidnap my doctor, daughter, it would not be theft of human. Right? And if they were to kill my daughter, it would not be a tort. Right? And, you know, like, and I don't own my daughter. Right? And yet we, can, we have this, like, this whole body of law that describes the fact that she has an interest in herself and I have an interest in her. My wife, who's her mother, has an interest in her. Her grandparents have an interest in her. Her friends, society, her school. Uh, we, we can manage this, these conflicting, overlapping interests, specifically because we don't use property, right? If we were talking about people as property, then one person would have to own them. And so with ideas, you know, we, we really struggle when we put it, when we make ideas property. I mean, you think about things like um, the mystery novel, which was invented by Edgar Allan Poe, at the same time as a whole bunch of other people were simultaneously inventing the mystery novel, because when it's mystery novel time, you get mystery novels, right? <laughs> And, and we, we have this choice, right, which is that we either say all mystery novels owe a debt to Poe, like a literal actual debt, like we should be paying royalties to Poe, or we say Poe's contribution was plumbing and is deserving of no recognition. Because in a property world, either you own something or you don't, right? Either you can collect rent on it or it's, public, or it's put in the public domain. But if we say that there's like an interest, then we can acknowledge a complex encumbered debt to Poe that doesn't mean that we need Poe's permission or the permission of his far-flung descendants or cousins or whatever to write mystery stories, right? But we can, but we can nevertheless pay homage to Poe and acknowledge his contribution. 
But we need sui generis regimes for that, and we need them for privacy too. Are there any uh, fellas? Yeah, how about you? You're close to the mic. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but I know you've spent a lot of time living in England. Uh huh. Do you see any exit for the? Any, oh. <laughs> do, you see, do you see any way that they can get out of this in one piece? It's really complicated. Uh, I, I've watched it from afar. You know, I left just ahead of Brexit and I landed just in time for Trump. Uh, <laughs> which, if nothing else, convinced me that uh, this is not a local phenomenon. You know, I think that there are a bunch of people in Turkey who are like, how did Turkey go crazy? Who, who are not paying a lot of attention to, say, England. You know, or, or well, people in Syria, obviously, having that, that experience. I think this is a, that, that we're living through a kind of global pathology. And I think that whatever happens in the UK, it's not going to be the end. You know, I'm skeptical of the calls for a second referendum, as, as sympathetic as I would be to a second referendum that, that went for remaining in the EU. Um, I think that if you say, well, a 52% majority doesn't count unless it's the majority we like, then uh, you are setting the stage for decades of grievance uh, and political instability. Um, and I think that we are probably starting at the effect and not the cause, right? People are disenchanted with their lives in the UK because of, in my view anyway, because of inequality and a deconstruction of the welfare state and the belief that things will be worse for their kids than they were for them and the end of social mobility and an era of precarity that has made them feel that they live in a scarce, uh, zero-sum world where there's just not enough Britain for everyone. You know, Greater London has a huge housing crisis. It also has more bedrooms per capita than at any time in recorded history. It just has grossly misallocated housing. And the reason we have markets is because they're supposed to do efficient allocation. And we've, we've turned that on its head. We've said the allocation must be efficient because a market did it. But when you have people who like literally can't afford to live in their city, right? Housing is like on Maslow's hierarchy, just above food. Right? If you have nowhere to live because markets have misallocated your housing, and it's undeniable that when you have uh, the greatest ratio of, of, of bedrooms to people ever and you have a housing uh, crisis, that you have a misallocation, then there's something that's gone terribly, horribly wrong. And I think that like all of the goodwill in the world and all of the talk about uh, you know, xenophobia and um, uh, you know, corruption and whatever, all of that in the world is not going to get people to a place where they get away from that xenophobic, scarce mindset until we get also to a place where people no longer feel precarious. And it's, a, it's kind of a council of despair to say, well, we can't solve this problem until we solve all the problems. But maybe it's by way of saying we need to solve all the problems at once and stop thinking about this problem as existing in isolation. Um, I, we're done, but you can ask your question when you come up if you'd like. Uh -huh. How could the housing situation in the UK be resolved? Well, I think we could resolve a lot of the housing problem in the UK by um, reinstating social housing. So there are a lot of people who are uh, in uh, houses that are much bigger than they need because they're pensioners who think that if I stay in this house long enough, given the trajectory of housing prices, when I die, this house will be worth so much that my progeny will each be able to buy a house. And so they're living in one room of a six-room house in the hopes that their five kids can buy five houses because the speculators will have driven their housing price up. So providing housing for working people at below market rates would be really good. I think having a register of beneficial owners of homes would be, would be really good. So much of the housing in the capital is, and, and here, are empty safe deposit boxes in the sky held by offshore criminal money launderers. Um, in Vancouver, a register of beneficial owners uh, cooled the housing market really effectively. Um, because, you know, if you're a, a Chinese bureaucrat who's been stealing from your state government and you're going to invest it in a, a flat in New York, um, if you have to disclose your identity to do that, then you won't do it. Right? And so that just takes a lot of the pressure off. And then finally, zoning. I think you just say, first of all, you say higher density, which obviously in New York is not a problem, but is in London. And then second, you say affordable housing. 56% uh, of the demand in London, according to a recent survey, is affordable. 25% of the new housing starts are affordable. Stop building luxury flats.
you know, start building housing for normal people. Yeah. 300,000 houses sitting empty in New York and landlords won't reduce their prices. I don't know what to do about New York. I'm j I can only speak to London. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not an American yet. Uh, two and a half more years and I'll be eligible for citizenship. You can come to my ceremony. <laughs> One nation under Canada. That's what I'm talking about. Please, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Please give Corey and Julie a round of applause. Oh. I wanted to add, I know you're New Yorkers and you still have a lot of bookstores, but you have a lot fewer bookstores than you used to have. And you're very lucky to live in a, store, a city with as many bookstores as you do. And you should be very thankful to live in a city with a bookstore as, as superb as this one. And, and you should be sh sure to patronize it. And I'm not just saying that because they had me here tonight. It's really <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please keep it going for Corey and Julia. So we are going to sign some books now. If you have a copy of Radicalized or any of Corey's other books, we're going to line up on my right, your left side of the room in front of the speaker here. Um, we might take a little break just to give Corey and Julia some time to reset after such an engaging conversation.